we're going to go through this a little bit quicker than uh, ordinary plan. Um, so homework is still due on Tuesday. We should be able to get through all the examples today. Hopefully that will help you out on the homework. Um, and then exam revisions will be due also on Tuesday. And I'll give your exams to you back at the end of class today. Um, so today we're continuing to talk about the ranking cycle as we just saw in uh, real life. But we're talking about some modifications to the cycle that allow us to have greater efficiency and to uh, make it perform in a way that produces a network output that is um, larger than we would get ordinarily. So for the exam review, we talked about that before. The vapor power cycle, just by way of review, as we saw up there, you, you uh, have a working fluid that alternates between a liquid and a steam, and they're used to generate electricity. So regardless of the fuel source, he was talking about coal-fired power plants, but was using a propane tank to actually heat uh, heat or have combustion going in the boiler, we can still analyze them the same way. So he mentioned several different things that that system was measuring. It was measuring the flow rate of the fuel. It was measuring the pressure in the boiler, the temperature at the output of the boiler, the temperature at the inlet and the outlet of the turbine, the temperature in the condenser. And it also measures the, or you can measure the, um, the total mass accumulation in the condenser as well. So a lot of useful information that allows you to perform an analysis of the system. And real power plants are the same. They have valves and um, pressure meters and temperature meters on every single little connecting piece within the, the power plant so that if anything goes wrong, they can quickly identify where it's going wrong. Um, so the red keen vapor power cycle in its most basic form we looked at on Tuesday. So we have isentropic compression in a pump heat addition in the boiler, isotropic expansion in the turbine, and then constant pressure heat rejection in a condenser. And we talked previously about how the real cycle deviates from the ideal cycle. And so as we're approaching these, um, these processes, we can, one, look at them as ideal so that we can analyze them easier. But also, in another way, we have something to shoot for. So if we look at our ideal process on paper, and then our actual process is performing less than optimally, we can try and figure out where the inefficiencies are, where the irreversibilities are, and try to minimize them. Additionally, there are things that we can do in order to increase the network output. So we talked about last time increasing the boiler pressure. And as Jim was talking about today, you know, that's extremely dangerous if you get the boiler to a pressure that is too great. There's a relief valve on the top to um, expel the steam and reduce the pressure because otherwise you could have catastrophic failure. So we're somewhat limited in how high we can take this boiler pressure without causing uh, safety concern within our system. Um, and additionally, as we increase the boiler pressure, it moves us further to the left on this line here. This one moves further to the left, which means that it as we cool in the condenser, as we run through the turbine and then reach the condenser, uh, that we reach the saturated vapor line much sooner, which the ultimate consequence of that is that we have more moisture in our turbine, which is an un unintended um, result. So we want to take advantage of the increased efficiency with an increased boiler pressure without having excess moisture at the turbine exit. So there's two different things that we can do. One is talking about superheating the steam to extremely high temperatures. Okay, so that device, you're superheating the steam within the boiler. That's how we have the Rankine cycle rather than the Carnot cycle. So we can do it to a certain extent, but again, safety is a concern. An alternate approach, similar to what we saw in the gas power cycles, is to heat the steam in between two stages of the turbine. So we heat it up in the boiler, run it through a turbine that's at high pressure, heat it up again, and run it through a lower pressure turbine. So by doing this, this is called the reheat process. It's important to note the difference between reheat and regenerate. So this is the reheat process, where it's a practical solution that allows us to still gain the advantage of an increased efficiency without worrying about safety concerns. So again, anytime you add additional components to your system, you run the risk of reducing your efficiency overall, um, and it increases the cost of operation. However, you have to 
to counterbalance that and determine whether or not those increased costs and those decreased efficiencies make up for how are made up for in the power that you're able to generate with the greater work output. So let's just look at the ideal reheat ranking cycle. So we have a high pressure turbine and a low pressure turbine. And you can see from this diagram that in between the two turbines, the steam coming out of the first higher pressure turbine is sent back to the boiler through the reheat process. Now you can see that it's not in direct contact with the steam that's already in the boiler, but the boiler steam is acting as a heat exchanger in order to add some heat back into the steam as it comes out of the first turbine and goes into the second turbine. So you're reheating the steam without mixing again with the steam that's already in the boiler, if that makes sense. So it's a distinct operation that the flow through here does not combine with the flow through here. We're just using that steam to, to reheat the steam coming out of the first turbine. So now we have two heat-in processes. There's our primary heat-in process from the boiler, which is from uh, state two to three, and then there's our secondary or our reheat process, which is from state four to five. So when we consider the heat into our system, we have to look at both stages. We have to look at the primary boiler process as well as the reheat process. And now we also have two turbines to consider. So we have to uh, analyze and calculate the work output of turbine one and the work output of turbine two. So this overall serves to increase the efficiency of our system over having a single heat input and a single turbine, assuming that we um, matched the pressures accordingly. So if our pressure at the inlet of this turbine and the outlet of the final turbine for that overall pressure difference, if we replace one turbine with two, then we achieve a higher efficiency, and that's a desirable effect. So incorporating this reheat stage can increase the efficiency by 4 to 5%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're dealing with efficiencies that are already so low, like 20%, increasing it by 4% actually can be a significant increase in uh, monetary influx due to increased energy production. Um, however, each subsequent turbine that you include, or each stage that you um, include for a reheat stage, will only increase the efficiency by about half of, half of the value of the previous stage that you implemented. So if the first stage you increase efficiency by 4%, the next time you're only going to increase by 2%, then 1%, then half a percent. So there's diminishing returns the more stages you add. So again, it's one of those optimization processes where you have to determine how many stages are feasible and what benefit does it give us in our ultimate goal of energy production. Um, when we reheat the, the this, um, steam coming out of our first turbine, the temperature going into our second turbine, so the temperature at state five, is going to be very close to the temperature coming in at state three. That's ideal. In practice, it's always going to be slightly less because you can't um, continue to transfer heat when the fluids are at the same temperature. So for optimal uh, heat transfer, it ends up being slightly less, but in practice, we often model those at the same inlet temperature. And then the optimum reheat pressure is about one quarter of the maximum cycle pressure. So when we're looking at uh, the pressure drop between these, uh, the inlet of this turbine and the outlet of this turbine, is all, it's going to be uh, about 75% and then a quarter for this. Okay, so let's do an example because that always helps to kind of solidify um, the understanding of these problems. So we have an ideal reheat ranking cycle. And you will have homework that's very similar to the exam some of the examples that we do today. But in this um, process, the working fluid operates the boiler at 15,000 kilopascals with water as the working fluid operates. Okay. 15,000 kilopascals, so our pressure here is 15,000 kilopascals or 15 megapascals. And then the reheater is at 2,000 kilopascals. And the 
condenser is at 100 kilopascals. The temperature is 450 degrees at the entrance to the high pressure turbine. So the first turbine is always the high pressure turbine. And then again, it's 450 because we're assuming that the reheater works perfectly at the entrance of the low pressure turbine. The mass flow rate of the entire cycle is 1.74 kilograms per second. And if you were to do a mass balance, you would see that the flow rate does not change through any of these components because it is continuous. So we want to determine the power consumed by the pumps, the power produced by the cycle, and the rate of heat transfer in the reheater. And then after we know those values, it's easy to calculate the thermal efficiency of the system. So in this problem and in all of the problems to follow, probably for the rest of the chapter, um, it's advisable, again, that you really pay close attention to what's happening on the property diagram or on the system diagram and be very careful when labeling your pressures, temperatures, and other property values. So at state one, we know that coming out of a condenser, we're going to have a saturated liquid at 100 kilopascals. So state one is fully specified. State two it's going to be a compressed liquid, and the pressure is going to be the same as the pressure at the outlet of the boiler. Because the purpose of this pump is to take this condensate up to the boiler pressure. Coming out of the boiler, we have 15 megapascals, 450 degrees C. That's given to us. Coming out of this high pressure turbine, we have 2,000 kilopascals for our pressure. And we know that S4 is going to be equal to S3 because it's an isentropic process. Coming back into our low pressure turbine, we have 450 Celsius, and it's also going to be 2,000 kilopascals because this pressure does not change as it goes through the reheater. So that is fully specified. And then coming out of our low pressure turbine, we know that we're going to be down to the, the condenser pressure, so it's going to be 100 kilopascals. And our entropy at state 6 is going to be equal to our entropy at state 5. So even though we don't know all of the property values at this exact moment, they're all able to be determined because we've got two independent variables for each state. Okay, The one exception is state 2. But the property values at state two are easy enough to find. Okay, for state one, it's 100 kilopascals saturated liquid. So we find V1 is equal to 0 0.00104, 3 meters cubed per kilogram. And S1 is 1.3028 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. State 2 is actually at quite a high pressure, 15 megapascals. And fortunately for us, we have a table for compressed liquids at, 14, at 15 megapascals. And this pump is isentropic, so we know S2 is equal to S1, which allows us to interpolate on table A7 to find our enthalpy value of 433.07 kilojoules per kilogram. State 3 is fully specified. It's 15 megapascals and 450 degrees C. So we just go to table A6. We can look up our enthalpy at state 3 and our entropy at state 3. The enthalpy is 3157.9 kilojoules per kilogram, and the entropy is 61434 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, so we're just moving around. We're now on to state four. We know the pressure is 2,000 kilopascals. And our entropy at state four is going to be equal to our entropy at state three because it's an isentropic turbine in the ideal ranking cycle. So we can find our enthalpy at state four is equal to so first we have to find our quality, which is 0.95, and our enthalpy ends up being 
0.78 kilojoules per kilogram. State 5, it's fully specified at 2,000 kilopascals, 450 degrees C. It's superheated, so we're on table A6. We find our H at state 5 is equal to 3358.35 kilojoules per kilogram. And our entropy at state 5 is 7.28645 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And then state 6, again, it's 100 kilopascals. That's given to us because it's approaching the condenser. We know that S6 is equal to S5. So then we can look up our uh, enthalpy. Turns out we need to calculate equality at this one, 0 0.988. And our enthalpy is 2647.9 kilojoules per kilogram. So you know that T3, the temperature of state 3 and the temperature of state 5 are equal because they both go through that reheating process? Well, one is through the boiler and one is through the reheater. But it says specifically in the problem that the temperature is 450 at the entrance of the high pressure and the low pressure turbines. If you were given, if you were given a different temperature, then you would just use that value to figure out your properties at state 5. Yeah. So it's, it says explicitly, and I think maybe in your homework it's two different temperatures, I can't remember. But. Um, it's easy enough to do because it, it will give you a pressure and a temperature. It will be specified. Okay, so we've gone through, we've found all of the enthalpies at all of the states. We just step through each step of the process. Once we've done that, it's easy enough to calculate the things we need. So the work of the pump or the power of the pump is equal to M dot times V1 times P2 minus P1. Okay, we could also do H2 minus H1 times M dot. But in this case, either one is fine. The work or the power of the turbine is equal to M dot times H5 minus H6 plus H3 minus H4, because we have two turbines now. And Q dot reheat is equal to M dot times H5 minus H4. And then our thermal efficiency is equal to uh, oh wait. Q work dot net. We're supposed to do work dot net too. Yeah, work dot net to the work dot of the turbine minus the work dot of the pump. So these two values that you already calculated. So then our thermal efficiency is equal to work dot net over Q in, where work dot net is equal to this value here. And our Q dot in is M dot times H3 minus H2 plus this Q dot reheat. So if you solve for all of these values, the work of the pump, or the power of the pump is 27.04 kilowatts. Turbine is 2026.35 kilowatts. So the Q reheat is 1138.95 kilowatts. And the thermal efficiency is 34%. And I know we're going through this very quickly, but it should give you a pretty good basis for it. Okay. So reheat is one way to increase the efficiency of the cycle. Another way um, we can increase the efficiency or increase the network output is to transfer heat from the from the um, from the turbine to the, the liquid that's going into the boiler. So essentially, we use some of the waste heat from the turbine process in order to preheat the steam as it goes into the boiler, or 
create the liquid as it goes into the boiler. Because as you're adding heat to this liquid, you necessarily will have a low efficiency. Um, and you have to add more heat in order to get it up to a boiling temperature and then even more to get it up to superheated steam. So if you can preheat that liquid before it goes into the boiler, then you require less heat input to your system in order to achieve the same goal. So the regeneration cycle allows us to take some of this heat from the turbine that's being expelled and use it to preheat uh, the steam. So a feed water heater is any device that's used to heat the feed water. And the feed water is just the, the water that's coming from the pump going into the boiler. So open feed water heaters are basically just a mixing chamber, meaning that the fluids combine and mix together in order to be heated up. So steam from the turbine will be mixed with liquid water, and then the end result will be sometimes a saturated liquid vapor mixture, depending on the temperature of the steam, or maybe just really, really warm liquid about to vaporize. Um, ideally, we'd like it to be at least a saturated vapor, but not always. Um, but in doing this, we have to add an additional pump into our system because as we bleed off some of the steam from this turbine, we'll have to pump fluid up to the feed water in order to mix that liquid with the steam. And then once it leaves the feed water heater, we have to pump again to increase the pressure up to the boiler pressure because it's not going to leave this feed water heater at the same pressure as the boiler. We need to necessarily increase the pressure. So when we're calculating all of the different components, the Q in is just this H5 minus H4. Q out is going to be 1 minus Y times H7 minus H1, because not all of our steam goes directly into the condenser. We're now separating it off. The work of the pump in, again, is also uh, contingent upon how much of that steam is being transferred to it. So in this line, we have 1 minus y times the work of this first pump. And then in the second line, we have y, 1 minus y coming into the feed water, but it's 1 coming out. So this is just the fraction of the steam that's being bled off. Then we just multiply this P3 times P4 minus P3 is just the work of the pump. So this first pump, only a fraction of the liquid <coughs> system is being pumped by it, but the second pump is, is pumping all of the liquid. So we have two different mass flow rates now in our system that we have to account for. Um, well, three, I guess, one, two, and three. Um, but we can Simply by doing a mass balance, we can find that there's really only one variable, y, that's the fraction of steam that's extracted. Yes? The uh, open feed water here, yes. that is basically like a mixing chamber? Yeah. Yeah, so hot steam's coming in, cold water's coming in, and then hot water is coming out. So it's just using some of that steam to preheat. But you notice, too, because we're bleeding off some of the steam, you won't have the full mass flow of the steam going through the turbine anymore. So again, it's a balancing act. How much steam do I bleed off? How much benefit do I get from it? That you have to optimize this Y value um, to get the best outcome for your system. Okay, so let's do an example of this. We're going to do two examples. And actually, before we do this example, I'm just going to talk about the closed feed water heater because the examples are very similar. Um, in a way. Okay, so a closed feed water heater is is another way of doing exactly what we just talked about, preheating the steam before it goes into the boiler. But this time, instead of letting the fluid streams mix, you're going through a heat exchanger with distinct uh, pipelines. So when we look at a closed feed water heater compared to an open feed water heater, we now have this condensate being pumped to this feed water heater, but it's not mixing with the steam that comes through. So these are two distinct lines of flow. We have flow coming from pump one to this mixing chamber, and we have flow coming from this line seven over to pump two. Okay, so when we do these examples, it's very important to look at the diagram and make sure you understand where everything is going and where everything is flowing, and we'll set that up um, in these examples so that you can properly label and account for all of the pressures in the system. 
So this first example, I'll set it up for you, and the property values or the pressure values are exactly the same as far as the high pressure, the low pressure, and the intermediate pressure. So many of your, of your properties, um, you only have to look up once, and then when you, this is the same for your homework, that you look them up once and then you already have those values when you start doing part B of your homework problem on the last problem. So we'll talk about how to, how to do this and set it up first and then hopefully get through some of it. Um, so the turbine inlet is at 3,000 kilopascals and 350 degrees Celsius. So where on this diagram is that? What state is that? The turbine inlet. Five. Five, right? So 3,000 kilopascals and 350 degrees Celsius. And the condenser is at 20 kilopascals. Steam is extracted at 1,000 kilopascals to serve the open feed water heater. So what does that mean? Where is that 1,000 kilopascals? Six. State six. So this is 1,000 kilopascals. So let's look at some of our other properties on here. So what is the pressure at state seven? Two thousand? There isn't even two thousand on here. I was doing three thousand minus one thousand. No. <laughs> it's either three thousand, one thousand, or twenty. It's one. Third? Twenty. Twenty. Three. Three. It's twenty. Okay, so coming out of the turbine, there's no pump or anything in between the turbine and the condenser. So the condenser pressure is twenty kilopascals. The pressure coming out of the turbine is also twenty kilopascals. Okay, now what about this pressure here at state one? Still 20. It's still 20 because we haven't pumped anything. We're assuming there's no pressure losses in the condenser. So what's coming out of the turbine and coming out of the condenser should be at the same pressure. And ideally, this will be 20 kilopascals and X will be equal to zero, meaning it's a saturated liquid. Okay, what about state two? What do you think? If we're combining things together in a mixing chamber, they should be at the same pressure, right? So this will be 1,000 kilopascals at state two. So this pump takes it from 20 kilopascals to 1,000 kilopascals. <coughs> and at this state, we know that S1 or S2 is equal to S1. So this state is fully specified, and this state will be fully specified. Um, state three, what's our pressure? One thousand. We've got one thousand coming in. Oops. One thousand coming in. One thousand going out. Okay, what about state four? Three. thousand, right? So we're pumping it up to the boiler pressure. And then of course state five we've already determined it was three thousand. Okay, so let's talk about some of the other ways um, that we need to look at these properties in order to figure out what they are. So state five is fully specified. We can look up at this in table A6, right? 3,000 kilopascals, 350 degrees Celsius. State one is fully specified, 20 kilopascals. It's a saturated liquid. State three, ideally, coming out, is going to also be a saturated liquid. So it's a just at that point. Saturated liquids. Saturated liquids, not vapor. Because you can't pop a vapor. Okay. Um, state six, we know that it's 1,000 kilopascals and that S6 equals S5. So that allows us to solve for the enthalpy there. And the same goes for state seven. It's at 20 kilopascals and S7 is also equal to S5.
then at stage four, 3,000 kilopascals, and this pump is isentropic, so S4 is equal to S3. So we have two independent variables at each of those states. One trick, that the work of the pump is equal to V1 times P2 minus P1, this is pump 1, which is also equal to H2 minus H1. So H2 is equal to H1 plus the work of pump 1. You know P2, you know P1, we can look up V1 easily. Same thing for pump 2. Pump 2 is V3 times P4 minus P3 is equal to H4 minus H3. So H4 is equal to H3 plus the work of pump. So that's how we find H2, that's how we find H4. And then to find this Y value, or the mass fraction, we need to do an energy balance on the feed water heater. So we find that it's Y times H6 coming into the feed water heater, plus 1 minus y times h2 coming in to the feed water here is equal to h3 going out. So what's y is just some number? It's the fraction of the mass flow rate that goes into line 6. So y is equal to m5 over m6, something like that. But you never even have to know, m6 over m5. You never even have to actually know the mass flow rate. You just need to know the fraction of the flow rate that gets diverted. So we can solve for y is equal to h3 minus h2 over h6 minus h2. And then we use these other equations for the work of the turbine is equal to H5 minus H6 plus 1 minus Y times H6 minus H7. The work of the pumps is equal to 1 minus Y times the work of the pump 1 plus the work of the pump 2. Q in is equal to H5 minus H4, and then the thermal efficiency is equal to work net, which is going to be the work of the turbine minus the work of the pump over Q in. Okay, so those examples are attached to the PowerPoint that's online. This first example is there, this is the second example. The third example with the closed feed water heater, let's talk about that too and set it up briefly in the next couple of minutes. Um, so, looking at pressures again, we have uh, the numbering is slightly different, so pay careful attention to that. State 1 is still 20 kilopascals, saturated liquid. State 2 is still, uh, or is now, a pressure that we have to determine. So let's follow the line between the closed feed water heater and this mixing chamber that it's going to be the same pressure as what's going into the boiler. So what pressure would that need to be? 3,000 kilopascals. Yeah, 3,000 kilopascals. So 3,000 kilopascals and S2 equals S1. Stage 3 is here. It's the same pressure that's coming out of this intermediate section of the turbine. So what pressure is that? 1,000. So state 7 is 1,000, state 3 is 1,000 kilopascals. What about state 4? 3,000, 3, right? Because it's mixing with the fluid that's going into the boiler. State 5 is 3,000 kilopascals. State 6 is 3,000 kilopascals. What about state 8? It's 20, right? Okay, 
So some additional assumptions that you can make is that at stage three, your quality is equal to zero. So it's a saturated liquid. And then the assumption So the steam leaves as a saturated liquid at state 3, and then at state 9, T is equal to the saturation temperature at the pressure of the steam, so at 1,000 kilopascals. So when you're looking at property values at state 9, P is going to be equal to H sub F plus V sub F times P minus P sub. So this is the compressed liquid approximation here, but then this is a correction factor for higher pressures. Okay, so this should hopefully give you enough to work on that homework. And again, the examples are scanned and they are in um, attached to the PowerPoint for this lecture. So understanding the main differences between the reheat cycle and the regenerate cycle. What, how are they different? What does that even mean? And then the differences between open feed water heaters and closed feed water heaters. So being able to look at these diagrams and figure out where the fluids are going, how you would calculate your work inputs, how you would calculate heat outputs, or thermal efficiency, things like that, also very important. So I'll see you on Tuesday. Grab your exams before you go.